Uh, do you hear me well? Like in the last rows? It's okay? Because sometimes there's some problems with microphone. So welcome to our presentation. Uh, we'll talk about uh, using vectorized text and using some supervised methods for um, seeking similarity between objects for, for objects uh, clustering. Uh, so this is our agenda for today. Um, so this is our company profile. So we are one of the largest e-commerce platforms in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, we have millions of offers, we have millions of users, so a lot of data, a lot of behavioral data uh, coming from our website. Um, so, and we use uh, machine learning and deep learning recently uh, quite a lot because we have a lot of complicated data, so text and images, for instance. So this is our data science tools that we use, really as data scientists at Allegro. So we use Python a lot. So uh, we use uh, scikit-learn, um, TensorFlow, and Keras for machine and deep learning um, to transform and to query our uh, huge uh, data warehouses. We use Spark, PySpark, for instance, and Presto, which is a very fast in-memory uh, query engine. Uh, and we use uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, to share code, to experiment with data, and to do some uh, um, real time uh, so to do some analytics. Um, so probably you don't know a lot of this stuff. Uh, so uh, to introduce the topic, I will tell you something about word embedding. So turning words or f uh, or sentences or phrases into vectors. Uh, so how many how many of you used word to vec or Glove? So quite a lot of people. So then I don't have to talk a lot about, about this. So, so for people who didn't use it, uh, when you have a word or a sentence, you really don't want to one hot encode it into just very long vectors of zeros and ones, because then it's very difficult to work with such data, uh, especially if you have very large corpuses like millions or ten thousands of millions of words. Uh, it's much better to use some uh, clever techniques like, so a very famous one was created at Google by Mikolov and his team, uh, which is called word to vec It's really using a neural network uh, to turn words, sequences of words into vectors. So there are many flavors to this technique like continuous back of words, which uh, you predict a word given its context, or skip gram when you really predict the context given a word. But the result of such technique uh, is usually a vector. So it's like a um, position of this word in a highly multidimensional space. And there are many nice things you can do. So for instance, machines prefer vectors than really uh, symbolic representations. So you can feed these vectors to other techniques like machine learning. Uh, you can do analogy uh, tests. Uh, I will show you it on, on the next slide. And which is very useful, and we use it a lot. So uh, you can really turn whole sentences into a vectors. So, for instance, if you have this very smart algorithm that changes uh, a word into a vector, usually we don't use such long, short vectors. So these vectors usually are like 256 or 128 units long, but this is just for the presentation. So you can change each word in the vector, and then really average uh, these vectors along the axis, so along the dimensions, and you can have a sentence vector. It's very nice. Um, but we didn't use word to vec It's very nice, but sometimes it takes too long to train. So what we use is a GLOF algorithm. Have you heard about this, maybe? Yeah. So it was uh, developed at Stanford University, and um, the difference between word to vec and GLOVE is that uh, in GLOVE, the first step is calculating the coherence matrix. And then what you really do is you run the model on, on this uh, coherence matrix. It's much better for large corpuses because, for instance, you have big data reoccurring in your sentences many times. And with word to vec you have to train the model every time it finds big data. And with uh, GLOVE model, it's just it's trained only once on such a pair. 
and it works very well with this famous analogy task. So, for instance, if you have a vector for king and then you subtract man from this vector and add woman, then you receive something similar to queen. So you can have this very nice uh, language relationships encoded into these vectors. Um, but the problem is with, we, we try to, to run some uh, very simple models for similarity on these vectors. But, and we tried to use some unsupervised techniques for clusterization of these vectors, but it didn't work very well. So we were searching for some architecture or some machine learning tool that will allow us to train something supervised techniques, which, which are usually much stronger and much better for such data. Uh, using these vectors or using uh, word embedding and we found an interesting idea which is called this uh, CMEs recurrent neural networks or CMEs neural networks it depends on the architecture uh, when you, the thing you are trying to build uh, is uh, so it's like a supervised way to uh, to learn a model that some objects are similar that they are just the same, or and some objects are should be very distant. Um, yeah, so this is the supervised method for learning uh, for learning uh, similarity between pairs. You can use text, so you can t turn text into vectors and feed it into model, or you can use images. Uh, for instance, you can run some uh, ImageNet uh, networks on on your images, turn them into vectors. Uh, or like VGG, uh, and then uh, seek similarity between objects. Um, so it seemed like an appropriate method for our tasks. So the problem in Allegro is sometimes that we have many offers, and we don't know that they are the same. So for instance, in books, we have many offers of books, like uh, Lord of the Rings, in many different versions. So for instance, the title might be Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, or Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, or Lord of the Rings, very cheap, sending 24 hours uh, from Warsaw and something like that. And we want to cluster them together, so that the similarity between such objects should be v uh, very high. Um, and there were some successful applications of such, such methods. You can find articles like uh, the one by Tax Kernel team. I think they are now the part of the Salesforce company. So they trained the CME's neural networks on um, different names for the same job offers. So, for instance, uh, architect and senior Java specialists were the same, and they were really wanted to train some models to clustered such, such job offers together. And there are some nice uh, nice modules based on TensorFlow published by eBay. So they have probably similar business uh, challenges like we, like we have. And you can find them on GitHub. And we already have experimented with Glove before, before using this uh, CMEs neural networks. So for instance, uh, we use them to find brands in offer titles and we had great results so how how many of you f have seen this cme's neural network architecture not many oh some people okay uh, so you t just take uh, two objects um, like uh, you can you can embed your text if you use text with some methods like glove or or tuvec or starspace it's a new method or you can just what one on what one hot encode them into into vectors and use some uh recurrent neural network layers like um um like uh, this by directional uh layer to encode, uh, to encode these vectors, uh, uh, so uh, you train these vectors with the whole network then. And then you can really um, use these uh, vectors and some hidden layers in your, in your network to calculate this Cousin distance or, or Euclidean distance. Um, okay. Um, so it looks like this. If you have two sentences, for instance, or two images, or two offers, 
Then you have this neural network architecture. You might have many hidden layers here. It depends on your task. You have outputs from these networks. And then you have this cousin similarity as an output. And then it should be like here be between minus one and one. So one is for similar objects. And uh, so we call them positive examples. And minus one is for a negative object. Uh, so we call them negative ex examples. And we really calculate uh, the loss function by using this output and the target variable. And then we just backprop uh, the error onto, uh, onto your uh, uh, hidden layers and or RNNs if you use them. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, what we had to do is to prepare the data set. So we had a nice uh, set of, uh, of uh, uh, clusters. So these were the titles and authors from a website called Lubimy Um uh, They were already web scrapped, I think, <laughs> before we used them. Um, so these were the positive pairs for our model. And we uh, to create the data set, we queried our search engine at Allegro for, for the books. So then you had a pair. You had a title of the offer from Allegro. And then you had this cluster. So this was this author and title from, from this web page, Lubimi uh, This gave us around 70,000 examples to train our, uh, our network on. But this was a small data set for Allegro. So just very small categories. So then we used a database from a Polish National Library, which offers uh, like almost all books that were published in Polish. You have author, ESBN, and title, and many other things about the book. And then we also uh, used the search engine at Allegro to create the data set. And then we had a 3 million data set, so much bigger. Uh, and there was a third iteration uh, where we um, so we found that many uh, salesmen at the group really place uh, ESBN number, so the identification number for the book, uh, not in the title but in the uh, description of the offer. Uh, it's not a required parameter, but it's quite often used. So then we could join the, the national library. Uh, database with with our uh, offers using this parameter, so it gave us a smaller data set, but with, with much higher quality. So, <laughs> you might find these results a bit strange. So, uh, this was the first iteration, just on the science fiction books. Uh, so, uh, there's a, a, a bit, uh, there's a difference between training and the test. Uh, Moment. So, in, in the training moment, uh, the, the accuracy you receive is the accuracy of uh, placing the negative and positive parts in, uh, uh, so, so labeling them in a correct way. But in the test moment, we didn't really want to um, uh, the model to check whether this pair is a positive pair or a negative pair. It's not the uh, it's not the final solution we are, we are seeking for. So, uh, what uh, to the test moment is uh, you take an offer from the test data set not used in learning and give all possible clusters to the model and then find um, uh, the cluster which has the smallest distance between this offer and the cluster. So, it's like, okay, here you have an offer from Allegro and find the, the best cluster. So, this this pair of, of author and title from from other database. So this would be the final cluster for this offer. Um, so uh, we had a quite nice results for such data. It's not a simple data. It's text with a lot of stop words and different phrases. Uh, not very clean. Uh, so we had some problems with the model uh, fitted on the very large database of 3 million offers. 
uh, and we really overcome this obstacle in the third iteration. Uh, we changed the model a bit, so we improved the loss function. Uh, we used imbalanced learning, so we gave the model much more um, negative examples in the training moment than previously. Uh, and what we did just yesterday, <laughs> uh, we used both uh, character encoding as an input and the glove vector of the whole sentence as input in just one model. So it has just two inputs and it uh, learned much better, I think. Um, so uh, there were some uh, experiments uh, we did on the data. Uh, so Rafa will present them now. Um, so we organized our work in the way that um, Mikai was working on one, appro on one one model with different approaches, and I was working on, on another one. My was more of like re research one because I al I only worked uh, on the smaller the smallest data set. Uh, so. Uh, regarding the date, I use only these uh, fantasy books. Uh, regarding the word embeddings, I used Glove with some default uh, for just for a start settings like window 5 dimensions 50. And my model was Siamese neural network uh, with distance uh, with Euclidean distance. And the last function was contrastive loss. And this is the implementation of uh, that comes from this this article. Um, so there's quite a lot of options that you can choose bef when you when you want to model something, let's say hyperparameters, and as you can see, there's just some uh, small list of different different things like the data, um, the way you prepare the data, the way you represent the data, uh, just the words, and when you move from words to to the sentences, uh, and when you decide that. Your representation will be glove. There's uh, there are also some hyperparameters. Another thing is uh, about the the training set. It can be balanced or imbalanced. And the next next thing is just the model, the architecture, that and all the the parts of the the architectures or the hyperparameters. So these are the hyper hyperparameters that I decided to to work with. And the orange ones are the ones that uh, I do some experiments with. Uh, just shortly, briefly about the the, the loss function, the contra contrastive loss. Uh, it it works. There's different loss for different different pairs. This is an example for the cos cosinus di distance, uh, co cosinus similarity, because I think it's easier to explain it on this example. So uh, the thing is that w when you have a negative pair and it already has a really and the, the pair uh, in the data has a really nice similarity, you want to penalize it harder than when you uh, when when you have a positive pair, one with just a uh, mm, bad similarity. Uh, so you just set the margin and. When the the similarity is over bigger than this, this margin, that you can probably find out using some descriptive analysis, uh, just for the start at least. Uh, then you penalize the model with the uh, higher cost function. Okay, so the first f f first results, accuracy on training set and test set was was really 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 high, but. Uh, as mentioned by uh, by Mikoi, this was just the balanced data set, and the the thing that should work in our uh, in our environment sh uh, is the one that sh which, which picks from all the clusters the one that's that's best. And when you when you test the data on such uh, data sets, so you just pick one uh, title and uh, compare the results. Mm, to uh, every cluster, it was just 44%. So the idea was, okay, maybe uh, we do not have enough negative pairs within our uh, training set, and it does not uh, cover the, the 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 real data or the the, the real um, 
uh, usage that we would like to have. Uh, that's why we decided to test different uh, imbalance ratios. And as you can see, the model is quite stable because uh, the, the accuracy, even on test set, is not uh, dropping a lot. However, the, uh, the accuracy on the uh, test set coming from this Cartesian product uh, is increasing a lot. So even when you have imbalance ratio 40 uh, to 1, so there, there is uh, 40, 40 times more negative pairs, it's, it's still quite stable. The accuracy, the accuracy on the, uh, this, let's say, final uh, test data is really high. But it's not much better. It's a little bit worse than the one uh, with imbalance 20 to 1. So I decided to stop with, with testing this, uh, this approach. Uh, so another thing that came to my mind was regarding the, the glove. So these two hyperparameters, window size and number of dimensions. And we came up with two hypotheses. The one uh, says that the smaller the window, the better representation. The second one, more dimensions, better representation. So the second one seems to be quite obvious because you will have more detailed representation. Uh, the first one may not be. So here's a little bo bit of an intuition. This uh, OW means other word, TW means title word, and AW means outer word. So if you take, for example, a window of four words, and I just pick the, the window uh, from the left side, and in Glove you always have the similar window, sim uh, symmetric window. Uh, you will describe, you will keep quite for a long time this uh, other words that for you should be treated as stop words. It's uh, like a rubbish when you compare it to the, to the, um, to the cluster. So you move uh, this, this window to describe another word, but you keep quite a, for a long time this, this other words. So we thought maybe it will not, it, this is the problem. Uh, but when you, for example, use just one word as a window, so the window size is one, just in, in the next step you already go out from this, uh, mm, let's say, stop words. And uh, here's the, the grid search for these this parameters. And it seems like the first hypothesis is more or less con confirmed. And uh, the second one, uh, surprisingly not, or maybe not surprisingly, the, the, the corpus was not big enough. And it might, be a, it might have been a problem. So we just used the, uh, the, the representations, and f we found Mm, we and we use them as a uh, very simple, very naive uh, um, mm, predictive model, clustering model, uh, just by taking the the distance, cal cal calculating the distance to each of uh, to every hour cluster. We decided that the the one with the the lowest distance is the best according just to this glove representation. So the next thing was to take the, the best glove and once more ra ra run it on different data coming from different balance ratios and compare it with the previous results. Unfortunately, they are not, they are not better. So mm, you cannot, it's difficult to say which, represent, which glo glove representation will be the best uh, uh, for your fun final model. And it's, uh, it's difficult to find this representation that w w will improve uh, your final model. Um, and mm, the thing that we, we already mm, thought that might be also the case that might be uh, important here, mm, just to improve this imbalancing, we could think only about the mm, negative pairs with the highest uh, uh, similarities so that you make the model, uh, the task for the model really difficult. So, for example, the difference between positive and negative pair will be just 1% uh, or something like that. Uh, so that you will not have to do so huge, you will not have to work with so huge imbalance ratios, but still you will uh, make the um, 
the the model work better because it, it's comparing for example to to normal cluster uh, alg algorithms we do not mm, work we uh, we do not control how much we move our clusters from each other so that's the that's the, that's re really a problem here and regarding the next steps uh um, Mikai will tell you what are our thoughts. Okay, uh, so uh, what we did in our models, uh, we used uh, character level encoding and sentence vectors, but as well you can use models which you fit on the whole sequences of glove, glove uh, vectors for each word. So these models might have much more uh, data, um, and this red data will be much uh, more rich. So uh, you don't lose a lot of information um, when you compress these vectors, these uh, this words into one sentence vector. Um, what I did yesterday, <laughs> and it works quite fine. So you provide uh, two types of input into your model. So first, you use this character encoding, character level encoding, and then you also use a uh, glove vector, so like two different representations for the same sentence or for the same title, and the model uh, works a bit better. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also what you can use for such models, you can, s uh, do you, you can switch off this shared uh, layers, so you, s you calculate separate weights for titles and for clusters. It might work better, but we have to test it. <laughs> and also, uh, there's a quite different architecture, which is much more similar to neural machine translation. Uh, so, uh, encoding, dec decoding networks with recurrent uh, layers inside. And then, uh, from the methodological point of view, it would be much better for us. So, we, what we do now, we try to uh, make some clusters and titles more similar. So, uh, with less distance in this multidimensional space, and some words and some clusters, we move them apart. But then, in such models, if we use translation models, then the cluster would be just an uh, output for the model. So we shouldn't really move the cluster in this multidimensional space. It should be constant. And then we should really uh, make a model that will translate our input, so our title, into this cluster. But this is uh, our hypothesis. We, we, we will likely uh, test it in the future. And yeah, the last thing, just to make this speech a more funny one, we found one word embedding joke <laughs> available online, so this is it. Maybe not the best one, but first one, I think. Yeah, so if you're in the word to vec models and causing distances, you find it quite funny. <laughs> So, this is the last page for you, m mostly. So, there are some links, some nice articles, and some nice books about deep learning, about uh, Siamese architecture, and about word embedding. So, thank you very much. And if you've got some questions. <laughs> So um, when I'm, uh, my question is basically about this exotic embedding of window one. Um, so the, the question would be, uh, because the intuition behind it is I have my latent space, which I initialize somehow, and then based on the co-occurrence matrix, I'm just moving the vectors, the, the, the ones that are co-occurrent, I'm going to move them closer. The ones that are not, I'm going to just uh, put them apart, right? That's how I get my embedding. Um, and then, of course, I put it at the, at the bottom of my, of my net. I'm training some, some things on top of it. Uh, my question is, was that layer frozen, in which case I think that's very weird. Um, if it wasn't, be, be, because I don't think this embedding space based on one uh, of window length one is, uh, is very dense. 
That's all. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I've never seen it before, and it's very interesting that it that it works. But uh, my my question is uh, whether you check the frozen and unfrozen scenario for this uh, for uh, for this uh, uh, embedding layer, and uh, and how dense was this embedding space? Because um, I, I kind of don't see how it uh, learned the embedding representation, and it's very interesting, you know how how that happened with uh, Window One. Maybe it was not really visible on this uh, short presentation, but window one, you just take one word, yes, around your target word, not zero words. So, so then it works, yeah. Uh, zero words would be just random noise, yeah, <laughs> just random initialization, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So maybe uh, Rafa wanted to show this is the target word. We just take one word, uh, both direction, yeah. Okay. Sorry, so uh, I, if you want to ask more questions, just uh, we can talk uh, later.